hello and welcome to Isle Education. My name is Susan Mills. I'm the Vice Chair of the North Carolina Republican Party. And with me today is our State Superintendent, Catherine Truitt. And we're very excited to have her here today. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, why Republicans are the family first po- uh, group and uh, what's going on with our students in education, what's right, what's wrong, and the challenges that we're facing. So thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Susan. It's exciting to be sitting here with you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like it's a real honor for me. So Superintendent Truitt, so tell me, um, since this is the inaugural Eye on Education, so you're our first one, so thank you so much. Uh, and from your position as superintendent, how does education factor into voters' minds this year for elections? Well, I, I think I know <laughs> that education is first and foremost in voters' minds because the polling tells me that. Mm-hmm. And we know that both nationally and within North Carolina that education and the economy are the top two issues for voters, for business owners, um, for all kinds of people. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that voters this year are going to study up on candidates and that they are going to um, vote with their consciences mm-hmm. and that they are going to um, really look closely at the issues and realize that if they want – Um, candidates who are pro-school safety, that they are are candidates that are um, pro-parent, that they are going to vote for Republican candidates. Well, and I think we've seen how that has really worked, especially in Virginia, right next door, when the focus turned to families first with all of the problems they were having up there. So I think... um, that's, putting our families first that, is a great thing. That is absolutely right. We we did see that in Virginia, and largely we saw that because um, the Democrats were ignoring families by ignoring school choice. When you ignore mm-hmm. school choice, you ignore families. Um, this month marks one year since Republican-led reforms in reading instruction. So we recently got some good news about that. And can you tell us more on our reading reforms? I can. This is such good news for North Carolinians, especially for our youngest readers. Um, So for the past several years, um, and I I would say even decades, um, we have been training our teachers while they are in in college to teach students to read by um, something called whole language instruction or balanced literacy, um, which is look at the picture and tell me what you think this word means. And of course, we know from research, you and I both as teachers, that that's not how Mm -hmm. the brain learns to read. And actually, um, it's very interesting, in 1987, California adopted a mandate that would require students to not learn with phonics instruction, but to learn with this whole language instruction, which has failed miserably. And within eight years, they ranked at the bottom of the country for reading right after Mississippi. So um, what the legislature has done, in particular the Senate in this case, Um, under Senator Berger's leadership, is looked at what the research says and created um, the Excellent Public Schools Act, which provides um, funding from both state and federal dollars to provide professional development for all of our pre-K through fifth grade teachers in a phonics-based approach to early literacy instruction. And I am really happy to tell you that um, after just one year, of the beginning of this training, which is actually a a Mm two-year training, we're already seeing incredible gains, especially in our kindergarten, first, and second graders. Um, That data is showing that their growth in reading is is outpacing the rest of the country. Our little ones are growing faster than the rest of the country, and that is certainly good news coming out of this pandemic. That is phenomenal. As a teacher, uh, and having a child that's much older than uh, high schoolers that are now hooked on phonics, I remember that. Yeah. And that was the way she learned to read. That's mm-hmm. 
it's amazing. I'm so glad to hear that we are going to go back to that because I think that's a way for children to learn to read. Yes. So, so my, my agency is fortunate enough to be um, managing the professional development mm-hmm. of 44,000 teachers in North Carolina. And we, you know, we did, we got a little bit of pushback at first about how teachers were, um, you know, hesitant to, to, to have one more thing that they had to spend time on as they were trying to get kids caught up after school closures. But you know what? We have seen a lot of teachers kind of turn around mm-hmm. and say, this was exactly what I needed. And I wish I had learned this sooner. And now, my students are going to benefit from from ha- me having had that professional development. Oh, absolutely. And that kind of brings me to uh, school report cards. That's something else because to me, if they're learning to read, the grades are going to be better and the report card for your school is going to be much better. So what can you tell us about that that's just recently come out? Yeah, the school report card is actually something that's um, very controversial and, and oddly enough, something that... Um, that a lot of Democrats and Republicans agree must change. And so um, I would love for candidates to familiarize themselves with how our school Mm -hmm. report card works. And it works like this. There's a mathematical formula Mm -hmm. that says you take 80% of a school's achievement, like how did kids do on the EOCs and the EOGs, and then how how far did they grow during the year? Did kids in a school... Um, improve. So they may not have mastered the material, but did they improve? That achievement is worth 80%. That growth is worth 20%. And that algorithm spits out a school report card letter. So in a year coming out of the pandemic, where we did not see a lot of uh, um, proficiency, like we we had really low test scores, kids were Mm. not, we know, that closing schools for as long as we did was not the right thing to do for our students. And now students are paying the price for that. So um, when a parent sees their school report card grade this fall, chances are they're going to see something that says that their child attends a low-performing school. And that's because this formula that we use doesn't really um, count growth for very much. We want students to be growing all the time, and so growth is really important. Um, but coming out of the pandemic, it's it's hard to see growth when kids missed a whole year of school. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of pandemic, um, parents have really had a hard time uh, with their children's education, of course, over the pandemic uh, stage. And now getting reengaged in local political process that we're trying to get our parents more involved in. Uh, pushing for a sound education that will help prepare their children uh, pr- to have a productive life. Mm-hmm. Do you have any um, advice or anything for those that may be running for school board on how to help work this out and get parents more involved? Well, certainly there's grassroots efforts are so important. I think all parents and even grandparents really want their voices to be heard when it comes to public education mm-hmm. and what's going on in their in their children's schools. Um, and there are lots of ways that parents can be involved in local schools, but one of those ways can be to either run for office or to support candidates who are running mm-hmm. for office. You know, join a team of someone who is running for office because it, it's a lot of time and effort and money to run for local office. So that that's one thing. Um, but I, I think that um, candidates really leaning into the fact that everyone wants to be heard right now. Mm-hmm. And when uh, one side seems to be discounting parent voice and prioritizing the system of education right. over the people who are in it, our students mm-hmm. and their families, I think that's a place where conservative candidates can really lean in. So can you see a way for us to really instill confidence in parents that their children are getting what they need in the classroom? I think that parents should feel really confident about what schools are doing right now. They're open. We do not have a massive teacher shortage, as has been reported in some places. We have very normal vacancy rates. Very Our our teacher 
attrition rate is very stable in North Carolina right now. We continue to monitor that data all the time, but really the, the, the idea that there was this mass exodus of teachers, just it didn't ever happen. Um, and so um, we, we, I would say that parents need to feel confident that their districts are doing everything they can to figure out what the needs of the students in their school are and target learning resources to those students. And um, that, that they should feel good about the growth that was, that was made this past school year when schools were mostly open. And that growth is just going to continue. We did see a big bounce back th th this past mm -hmm. year. And, um, and, and the data show that. Right, I know that I have seen that in my own classes. Um, and as you know, I teach career and technical education, or CTE. Um, there's such a need for people to go in to CTE and to have careers in CTE, uh, CTE jobs, but we really push a university or a college for your system. So talk to me about that. What are you planning on doing to try to really help others understand that there is a need and we are missing the boat if we don't look at doing something to help those students? Yes, I think one of the biggest lies that parents have been told over the last 15 years is the only pathway to the middle class is a four-year college degree. It's just not the truth. Um, we have lots of different pathways that students can engage in as they're coming out of high school. They can, we, all, we like to say they can be employed, enlisted, or enrolled. And enroll doesn't necessarily mean a four-year residential college. They could go to a community college. They could go to um, a, uh, a welding school and come out making a, a very sustainable wage uh, from one of those programs. There's all kinds of certificate programs. Um, I think the point is that this idea that all kids have to go to college after high school just has not panned out. And I personally, my agency, we declared 2022 as the year of the workforce. We have been working to create what's called a portrait of a graduate. We're looking at what are all the skills and competencies that a, a kid needs mm -hmm. when they graduate from high school to be prepared for the post-secondary plans of their choice. And again, that could mean going to the military. It could mean um, getting a job that has training with it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It could mean community college. The point is that there are lots of different pathways out there for a, a kid to choose. Um, the last thing we want is for someone who doesn't want to go to college or doesn't feel prepared to go to, go to college to incur debt so that they can, um, you know, go have that college experience that really isn't what they wanted in the first place. Well, you brought up the big word, student debt. Yes, So um, we have seen another round of uh, loan forgiveness for students. How do you feel about that? Uh, honestly, I feel that the Democrats have run out of ways to get voters to come onto their side. And so they are bribing young people with loan forgiveness, which I don't think the president really um, legally w should have been able to do. I mean, he, he is literally taking from one group and right. giving it to another mm -hmm. group. And the reason we know that is because the, the, the data is very clear that the people who benefited the most from this loan forgiveness mm -hmm. were people who had jobs and had taken out high amounts of graduate school um, mm -hmm. loans because graduate school loans are not capped. Okay. And so they took out hundreds of thousands of dollars to become doctors or lawyers. And they are, the data shows, the ones who typically pay it back. Mm -hmm. The people who are unable to pay back their loans are the people who don't finish. They in general, have about a fourteen thousand dollars that they they owe when they default, right. and so um, this is this is really a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Wow, that's just you know, to me, having gone to college like everyone else with par parents paying it or working through and yes. paying it yourself as you went, uh, to be able to just have ten thousand dollars 
written off. Uh, or or 20,000. Right, or 20,000, exactly. Yeah. It, I mean, my, my husband went to the Naval Academy so that he would finish college debt-free. Mm -hmm. And then he served another, he, he would have only had to have served five years, but he served another 30. Um, so it's, it's kind of, um, it, I, I take it personally oh, that yes. this loan was just written off. Um, all of the, all of his brothers mm -hmm. joined the military so that they would have um, their college paid for. And um, people make choices every day so mm -hmm. that they can avoid having to be saddled with student debt. Oh, absolutely. I could not agree more.